Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us and thank you so much for putting your questions through our Instagram stories. I'm Erica from the British Society for Immunology and I'm joined today by Dr. Megan McLeod from the University of Glasgow. Hi Megan. Hello. Um, and she'll be answering your questions today. So let's get to it. Question number one, Megan. When will there be a vaccine for COVID-19? We're in a really lucky position because we have 10 vaccines that are currently in clinical trials. That means that they're being tested to see whether they protect against the virus. We should know the results of some of those trials towards the end of this year. And that's exciting because then we'll know if those vaccines are protective, but it doesn't mean that things will change overnight. Those vaccines will have to be made in large quantities and then distributed across the world. So we're hopeful that we'll know whether we have a successful vaccine soon, but it is going to take a while for that to have an impact. The hope is that the vaccine will be released in targeted ways in the spring and summer by next year. Question number two, have scientists had to make shortcuts in clinical trials for the vaccine and what's the impact? No, I think it's important to know that safety has been a massive concern in the development of vaccines for SARS-CoV-2 that causes COVID-19 and any of vaccines that are released to the UK will have gone through those rigorous safety trials. It often takes a long time to make vaccines and that's because there's financial concerns about how successful that vaccine will be. It's so obvious that we need COVID-19 vaccines that those financial concerns have been pushed aside to a large extent. I think the other important thing to know is that many of the vaccines are building on previous vaccine research. So we already had good knowledge about the safety of those different types of vaccines. Question number three. When the vaccine is in place, what demographic groups are likely to be targeted first? Those individuals that are likely to be targeted first are those most at risk of severe disease from the virus. And then particularly that's the elderly or those with pre-existing conditions that make them more likely to have severe disease. We've learned a ton about COVID-19 disease since uh, the beginning of the year. So we do know who those individuals are. And those are the individuals who are most likely to benefit from a vaccine and they are likely to get the vaccine first. In other vaccines, for example, in influenza virus, we also target younger children and that's because they often spread the virus around really easily. So it may be that populations that are more likely to spread the virus will also be targeted, but it's likely to be those most at risk from disease that receive the vaccine first. Question four. Will everyone get the same type of vaccines if we end up with more than one? It's likely that we will end up with more than one because so many are being tested. And that's a good thing because it will make the feasibility of scaling up production and giving out the vaccine to be much more feasible. There may also be differences in the requirements for vaccines. So the type of vaccine that will work well in the elderly who are less good at making immune responses may be different from those that we give to other adults or to children. It's also likely that as more vaccines are tested in clinical trials, potentially more effective vaccines will be developed or ones that cause um, limited side effects when they're given to the individual. So we may see a change over time in the vaccines that are given and the differences in different populations. Question number five, will the antibody production through a vaccine and its retainment be as strong as the natural infection? Antibodies are those molecules that recognize the virus and stop it from getting inside your body. So there is some concern that the natural infection won't give you long term immunity against a virus. The different vaccines will work in different ways and are likely to give us different lengths of uh, protection against a virus. Some of those vaccines are very much based on the virus itself, so they may also give you short term protection and you may need boosters. Other vaccines use current ways to activate our immune system. And we know that they give much longer duration of antibody responses. So they may not need boosters or not need boosters so often. At the current situation, we know that the vaccines may actually give us better protection than the natural infection. Question number six. Will the COVID vaccine be a yearly requirement, much like the flu vaccine, or will it last longer? I think we don't know the answer to that question yet, but there's two ways we can think about it. 
One, as I've talked about in the answer to the previous question, is about how long our protection against the virus lasts for. So how long does that antibody or T cell immunity last? And that will depend very much on the vaccines that um, individuals are given. The other component to think about is the virus itself. We need those yearly flu vaccines because the virus changes a lot over time. So the virus you met last year is very different from the virus that is circulating this year. And each vaccine that you get each year contains that new virus that is circulating. We don't know yet in, in the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes COVID-19 how much it changes through time. The current data suggests it's not as um, likely to change as the flu virus is, so that's good news and means that the vaccines we're making now are likely to protect us in subsequent years. But we will have to keep watching. And the good news is that we have scientists across the globe tracking the virus and how much it's mutating, as well as scientists tracking how long our antibodies last for. And question number seven, how do we analyze the long-term effects a vaccine can have on our body? That's an important question and it actually is uh, related to all the drugs and the vaccines that we give to the population. We do follow up either specifically within the trials that are going on or just in the general population. So it's, it is a concern that something will cause uh, damage or disease, but we have excellent safety records in our vaccines and those will be monitored through time. Question number eight. Approximately how many people in the UK will need to be vaccinated for it to have a real impact? I think this question comes back to the idea of herd immunity. And herd immunity is where individuals in the population are vaccinated or infected with the virus. They build up immunity and then they're less likely to be infected and therefore less likely to transmit the virus to other people. And that's really important, especially for vulnerable people who may not be able to make a good response themselves to the vaccine. So if we can protect the community, we reduce tr transmission to those vulnerable individuals. We don't have a good idea for SARS-CoV-2 what level is required within the population to give us herd immunity. A good guess is about 70% of the population. According to the Office of National Statistics in 2018, there were 66.4 million people in the UK. So 70% of that is 46.5 million. So a lot of people need to be either vaccinated or haven't been infected to build up a level of immunity that will give us that protection as a community. And question number nine, this one's come from a Twitter poll. Will the vaccine be effective? I think effective can mean lots of different things. In the short term, the vaccine will not be effective in returning our lives to normal right away. What it will be able to do is to protect those who are vaccinated which is why it's important we give it to those who are most at risk of severe disease. I think in the long term, it will be effective in allowing us to go back to our more or less normal life of contacting people and moving around the world. And the final question, question number 10, how long will it take for COVID to disappear after a vaccine is found? I think that's an interesting question, but one that's really difficult to answer directly. We can learn a little bit when we look at other viruses we have been able to eradicate one virus from the human population, that smallpox, through a massive vaccination campaign. And we're very close to eradicating polio as well. It's important to note that these two viruses only infect humans. So we only had to worry about vaccinating the human population. If you look at the flip side, for example, influenza virus infects humans, but lots of other animal species as well. And it will never be feasible for us to vaccinate all of the individuals, humans and animals, that are at risk of infection by influenza virus. In terms of SARS-CoV-2, we do know that it can infect some pets. There's been some evidence of that. So it may be possible that we can't ever eradicate the virus because it is too widely distributed both in us and in other animals. That doesn't mean that we're going to live in the current situation forever. And that's because we will be able to control the virus through vaccination. We talked earlier about herd immunity, and that will lead to reduced transmission in the population. And we'll always be able to protect those most at risk, the elderly and those with pre-existing conditions through vaccination. So while we may not be able to disappear the SARS-CoV-2 virus, we will be able to control it and therefore return to 
much more normal lives where we have contact with our friends and families and can travel around the world again. Thank you so much, Megan. That's been really brilliant. I hope everyone's enjoyed that. So thank you so much. Bye. Bye.